realm, that resting place for the dead, where all of those who close their eyes for the last time going to sleep until the Lord will wake us all up again will find themselves. We recognize that there is a great gulf that separates the two locations. You have Paradise and you have Tartarus, and they are basically totally polar opposite places of existence, one of comfort, one of horrific pain and suffering. And so hopefully it makes the, the choice a little bit easier for us that we would certainly want to do everything possible to avoid the place of torment, of suffering. In fact, the language Jesus used in the Sermon on the Mount and other places uh, that we have been studying, he puts it this way, it would be better to cut off our arm or leg or pluck our eye out if it causes us to sin, better to enter into life maimed than to enter into hell with both of our limbs intact. So in other words, do whatever it takes, whatever is necessary for this for us to make sure we get to the place of comfort and eternal rest. As we want to move past the, the place of Hades, where after the resurrection occurs, uh, Jesus uh, tells us in the book of John that those who did the good deeds, there will be a resurrection of life, and those who did the bad deeds, there will be a resurrection of judgment. And we're going to be looking predominantly tonight at those who uh, what will be experiencing the blessing of doing the good deeds. Uh, those who have followed the Lord Jesus and are in the Hadean realm, or even those who maybe are on the earth, and when the trumpet is sound and will uh, go to God, experience judgment, and after that judgment, what that experience will be like to go to the eternal life with God. We're going to go to Re Revelation chapter uh, 21, tra chapter 21 and 22 where uh, John records for us essentially three pictures uh, that really sum up what that existence is going to be like. Uh, really kind of uh, have to appreciate the fact that it's going to be so sp um, spectacular. Words cannot describe it. That John had to put pictures and, and images in our minds just to get us in the ballpark of what this is like. So in other words, all the glorious images we will be looking at, just imagine your head, just multiply that by you know, another billion in terms of what the actual experience will be like. He's just giving us a taste, a mere picture, so we have some reference point. And those three pictures are a garden where the tree of life is for the healing of the nations. The second picture is the new Jerusalem, the epitome of worship where all that is holy and all that is righteous and all that is good will eternally be in the presence of God. And the third is of new heavens and new earth, a new existence, a new place where our experience will never be interrupted by anything sinful or painful or harmful ever, ever again. So what a blessing that we have this before us to motivate us to truly do as Jesus said, do whatever it takes. Whatever it takes to get there, it will be worth it. Whatever sacrifice, whatever discipline, Whatever pain we endure now, temporarily, will be worth it to enjoy all of eternity in heaven. It will be worth it all. So let us just go and look at what John describes for us in Revelation chapter 22. He begins with this picture of the tree of life. Actually, the very first uh, few chapters of Revelation, Revelation chapter 2, verse 7, he describes it as the paradise of God, where the tree of life is at, and no doubt is a a reference point to the very beginning stages of what God intended for all humanity to experience. That we were intended to be in the presence of God and to enjoy fellowship, to enjoy uh, all the good blessings that he wanted us to experience and to be blessed in his presence and to never be harmed by anything. And so the, the idea of passing through judgment and after we experience all the things we do through the gospel and being redeemed by Jesus, there is the blessing that there will be a restoration of going back to that existence, back in that garden, which is a picture of that sweet fellowship with God that is currently has been interrupted by sin and uh, by the uh, curses that have come because of that sin. But notice Revelation chapter 22. Let's start reading in verse 1. It says, then he showed me a river of the water of life, clear as crystal, coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its street 
on either side of the river was the tree of life, bearing 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nation. There will no longer be any curse. And the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it. And his bondservants will serve him. And they will see his face. And his name will be on their foreheads. And there will no longer be any night. And they will not have need of the light of a lamp nor the light of the sun. Because the Lord God will illumine them. And they will reign forever and ever. And he said to me, these words are faithful and true. And the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, sent his angel to show to his bondservants the things which must soon take place. And behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who heeds the words of the prophecy of this book. I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I heard and saw, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed me these things. He was in so much awe, the imagery, the picture, the sensation of what this blessing was going to be like and how fitting for John, who is pers presently being persecuted. He's suffering. He's in a place of torment, of, of discouragement, of, of pain and hardship because of his faith and how encouraging and exhilarating this had to be for John. Put, put yourself in his place. As Jesus is reminding him and giving him this beautiful picture, it's all worth it. Whatever sacrifice, John, you keep on keeping on. You keep on remaining faithful because this is what your existence for all of eternity will be like. You will be healed. You will be rewarded. You will be comforted. It will be as if all the curses just kind of uh, uh, went away and we went back to that peaceful, sweet existence back in that beautiful garden the way it was ever intended to be. And all the curses will be done away with. And notice what he says. He falls down in, in worship. He says, he showed me these things and I fell down. And notice verse 9. But he said to me, do not do that. I am a fellow servant of yours and of your brethren, the prophets, and of those who heed the words of this book. Worship God. In other words, the presence of the mere messenger made him fall to his knees. In other words, he said, as glorious as this messenger was, I'm just a servant. Imagine how amazing the presence of God is going to be. That if even the messenger, the angelic messengers of God causes those who witness them to just tremble, fall down, what an amazing experience that is going to be, to be filled with God's presence for all of eternity. But that's the picture that he wants us to see. Uh, move on a few other verses here as we move to the end of the, ch of the book. Verse 14. In verse 14, he says, Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter by the gate into the city. Outside are the dogs and the sorcerers and the immoral persons and the murderers and the idolaters and everyone who loves and practices lying. In other words, an eternal place of safety, protection. The idea that no, nothing could ever harm you ever again. Words, that, 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 that sinking feeling of, did we lock the door tonight? Did we lock everything up tight? Is everything secure? That's going to be gone. That's long gone. We're not going to experience that ever again. We will never, think about that, we will never ever have that sinking feeling. Are we protected? Is everything taken care of? That's, we don't have to worry about that anymore. He says nothing can enter there. Nothing that can harm or take us away from God will ever be a threat. What are, in other words, relief. The idea that the, the fighting soldier constantly looking over his back, never, he can put his weapons down, can finally be at peace, can finally enjoy his life. That's what he's saying. You can finally enjoy a peaceful existence the way we were meant to, without fear of harm at all. Nothing can come and harm you. Because in that presence, Everything that was wicked is done away with. Because they are then in the other place that we'll talk about next Sunday evening. Totally separated from the presence of God. And notice what it says here in verse uh, 18. In verse 18, he says, I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, 
God will add to him the plagues which are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his part from the tree of life and from the holy city which are written in this book. And so really, it's, it's a beautiful picture. Essentially, it's the paradise of God. Free from pain, free from worry, free from sadness, free from any threat of harm or wrongdoing. We can be at peace. We don't have to worry about anything ever again. And in this picture, there is the tree of life. And in this tree of life, it says that it is eternally yielding its fruit because it has access to this eternal river of life. And the reason why it's constantly flowing, the source of that river is from God himself. So John presents this image of the overflowing, abundant blessings pouring out from God and the blessing of having access to a tree of life that we can have eternal access anytime we wish and we will not be separated, we will not be hindered in any way. In other words, as if as God says, here, enjoy, partake. Live with me. And in a different sense, it is so much better than the original picture of the garden. Because remember, uh, in the original garden, you had only two people ever experienced that. You had Adam and Eve. You had one couple live in the presence of God. Here in Revelation... The idea is that all of the nations, did you catch that back up to verse 2? In other words, the presence of what it's going to be like in this garden, it's not, in other words, it's going to be very similar to our existence here in this world, filled with tons and tons of people all around us. Only we're going to have a certain type of people are going to be around us. Only the righteous, only the holy, only those who love God, only those who worship God, only those who truly appreciate how amazing God is. He amazing, amazing. I imagine it was like being, living in a city filled with these people. He says the nations will fill that. It's not just going to be two people. It's going to be every righteous soul living and sharing and abundantly glorifying God together. Wow, what an amazing experience that's going to be. That's what it says there in verse 2. It says, in the middle of its street on either side of the river was the tree of life bearing 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were what? For the healing of the nations, because it's going to be filled with literally nations and nations of all the faithful people from Adam all the way to however how many people exist in this world who serve the living God. Wow. There was just picture what it's like living in this existence, only get rid of all the evil, get rid of all the sin. And isn't that beautiful that it teaches us that the local church and even the universal church is a little microcosm what a blessing for when we get to come together to taste that. That's really what the Lord is inviting us to do when we assemble. Get a little taste of what it's like being surrounded by those who love and worship God. Because the garden is going to be filled in heaven with all of those who love him. And notice there is going to be a separation because notice in verse 10. In verse 10 it says, he said to me, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. Let the one who does wrong still do wrong, and the one who is filthy still be filthy, and let the one who is righteous still practice righteousness, and the one who is holy still keep himself holy. And notice verse 14. It says, Blessed are those who wash their robes, that they may have the right to the tree of life. Only those who have washed their robes, who have obeyed the gospel, only those who have tasted true victory in Jesus Christ, Christ, who have humbled themselves, who have done away with sinfulness. Only those who have truly lived that life have access. Notice verse 15, what a blessing. Outside. These people cannot come in. No one who fits this description will ever be allowed anywhere near this place. Who? The dogs. The sorcerers. The immoral persons. The murderers. And the idolaters. And everyone who loves and practices lying. We will never, ever be around that ever again. It's hard to imagine. <laughs> hard to picture, but that, that's the existence. And what a, a life worth living to achieve that. Now, as we move forward, there's a second image. And it's as if John says, okay, now that there's, there's a flashback of kind of going back to uh, re 
inst instating uh, an existence that existed long before the, uh, everything changed. But how about moving forward? There's going to be a new city. Uh, in other words, a new type of Jerusalem. And this picture of Jerusalem is this image of what, again, that existence is going to be like and, and ha presents for us another phase or, or aspect of this. Turn to Revelation uh, chapter 21. And let's read the first two verses. Revelation chapter 21, beginning in verse 1, it says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there was no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride, adorned for her husband. In other words, get ready for something truly beautiful and spotless and clean and pure and glorious. As glorious as that moment when a bride is united with her husband for the very first time. I know it's just nothing quite tops that beauty, <laughs> that picture of, of newness, of uh, bringing two things together, bringing God's people together with him. He looked at it in that, that anticipation. I can't wait to have my people with me. And notice the description uh, overflows with just, just spectacular uh, picture of, of glory. Beginning of verse 10. Uh, read verse 10. It says, And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her brilliance was like a very costly stone, as a stone of, of crystal clear jasper. It had a great and high wall with 12 gates, and at the gates 12 angels. The names were written on them, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel. There were three gates on the east, and three gates on the north, and three gates on the south, and three gates on the west. And the wall of the city had 12 foundation stones, and on them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. The one who spoke with me had a gold measuring rod to measure the city and its gates and its wall. The city is laid out as a square, and its length is as great as the width, and he measured the city with the rod. 1,500 miles, its length and width and height are equal. And he measured its wall 72 yards according to human measurements, which are also angelic measurements. And as we continue reading, notice the description of these glorious, uh, precious gems and precious stones indicating the brilliance of the reflection and the awe-inspiring uh, splendor of this beautiful place. In verse uh, 18, it says, The material of the wall was jasper, and the city was pure gold, like clear glass. The foundation stones of the city wall were adorned with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation stone was jasper, the second sapphire, the third chalcedony, the fourth emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth stardius, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysoprase, the eleventh jason, the twelfth amethyst. And the 12 gates were 12 pearls. Each one of the gates was a single pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. I, I love that. But you know what's amazing? Even as we try to align up our thoughts to that picture, again, notice he says the, like, he says the likeness. This doesn't even come close. Now, this is the best reference point that we have on earth to try to put ourselves in the right stratosphere of this heavenly image of this city, what it looks like. It kind of reminds me of the way Ezekiel speaks. You go back really, really quick and notice, remember when Ezekiel saw that image of the glory of God coming down from heaven and how he had to describe it with uh, very humbling uh, descriptions of, of human terms and reference points. Turn to Ezekiel chapter 1. This is very similar to what, what John is doing. But read Ezekiel uh, chapter 1, beginning in verse 27. In verse 27, here's Ezekiel's attempt to describe the amazing image of God coming down out of heaven in his throne room. In verse 27, he says, I notice from the appearance of his loins and upwards, I notice he's something like, that's kind of the, the language John, this is something like this. He says, something like glowing metal that looked like fire all around within it, and from the appearance of his loins and downward, I saw something like fire. 
and there was a radiance around him as the appearance of the rainbow and the clouds and a rainy day so was the appearance of the surrounding radiance and notice this 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 one gets me such was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the lord in other words i'm i'm struggling to put into words what i saw this is the best i, I have doesn't even come close but this is the best i have and what it made me do it made me fell on my face john essentially has the same reaction and essentially, what John is doing for those who are familiar with Jerusalem, remember Jerusalem was the epitome of the promised land. Of all the locations that Israel uh, cherished and was privileged to inhabit, it was Jerusalem was the center pride and joy of their existence. Because in Jerusalem, that is where Kings worship the Creator. It's the only place on earth where, where, where they gathered together to honor truly the Creator and honor worship that was acceptable to Him at that time. Jerusalem represented the ultimate promised land. But unlike old Jerusalem, which was dishonored by wicked kings and corrupted by them, it will be filled with the purest of kings, the King of kings will literally fill the glory of Jerusalem. <laughs> Where it's all those past failures and all those things that we read, the, 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 the corruption of mankind over and over again, that's done away with. And Jesus has replaced that, and there will be no one else like him or ever since him, and he will reign forever, and we will be his subjects, worshiping forever. Revelation gives us a little bit of a taste of the glorious worship services that will last for eternity in the new Jerusalem. Because that's what John is trying to do. He's trying to conjure up. Remember those glorious worship uh, uh, periods we had when, when everything was right for a moment, but now things have become so corrupt and so deteriorated. We're going to go back to that, and it's going to be so much more magnificent because we will worship face to face with God. Turn to Revelation chapter 4, and he tries to capture that for us, what that worship spirit experience is going to be like. In Revelation 4 verse 8, he says this, he says the four living creatures, each one of them having six wings, are full of eyes around and within. And day and night, they do not cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. And when the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, to him who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders will fall down before him who sits on the throne and will worship him who lives forever and ever and will cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things. And because of your will, they existed and were created. Where it's there is going to be reverence like we've never seen before. In other words, picture in your mind the most reverent image. For me, it's usually of a, someone getting down on their knees or just lowering themselves completely. Here the image is of glorious, angelic creatures created in God's image who themselves, as they stand before God, feel unworthy. And they cast all their glory and all their accomplishments and all their achievements, they throw them down, saying, only the Lord is worthy. But as you and I know, how humble, how humble Jesus is. What a, no one could be more deserving of honor than Jesus. As humble, as lowly as he is, it just fit, it's just right. Someone of that character, who is perfect and yet humble, serving, kind, compassionate to receive that kind of honor. And we get to surround him and enjoy that and, and, and sing these blessings and praises to him. Chapter 15. Chapter 15, it goes on. Notice in chapter 15, verse 1. It reads, Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels who had seven plagues, which are the last, because in them the wrath of God is finished, and I saw something like a sea of glass mixed with fire. And those who had been victorious over the beast and his image and the number of his name standing on the sea of glass 
holding harps of God. And they sang the song of Moses, the bondservant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are your works. O Lord God, the Almighty, righteous and true are your ways, King of the nations, who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name. For you alone are holy, for all the nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. I don't know about you, but sometimes I just get sick and tired of hearing the news. I don't know, I just get sick and tired of it. It's like even when you have a good day, or you have something that's, that's actually praiseworthy, and you have to have it soiled by some of the garbage that we hear going on in our existence. Filthy things. Wicked things. People have no regard for human life, no regard for how they were created. We will not have to hear that anymore. This is what our ears will be filled with for eternity. Well, our ears will never, ever again be soiled with anything filthy, vile, or wicked ever again. It will be nothing but the highest of praise at all times of the highest caliber. I don't know about you, but I don't think I'll ever get tired of that. That's the caliber of what we will be hearing and being around. And so anything else will never, ever be allowed to be there. And finally, my, my favorite, my favorite is Revelation chapter 19. Describes the fourfold hallelujah. We hear a fourfold chorus of singers. How beautiful that is, arrangement is. He describes a fourfold hallelujah echoing through the New Jerusalem. This is what he says here in chapter 19, beginning in verse 1. He says, after these things, I, I heard something like a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our God, because his judgments are true and righteous, for he has judged the great harlot who is corrupting the earth with her immorality, and he has avenged the blood of his bondservants on her. And a second time they said, Hallelujah. Her smoke rises up forever and ever. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who sits on the throne saying, Amen, Hallelujah. And a voice came from the throne saying, Give praise to our God, all you his bondservants, you who fear him, the small and the great. Then I heard something like the voice of a great multitude and like the sound of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder saying, Hallelujah. For the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. He has passed judgment in every vile, wicked, corrupt thing, and nothing but true goodness and righteousness and purity and love will reign forever. That's the new, the new Jerusalem, free from its past corruption, renewed in splendor and glory and righteousness. Truly amazing. And one third image... It's very interesting. It's caught in the dimensions. The dimensions are very interesting. They're very odd. Somehow they don't seem to really add up. Hence, he says that a lot of these are angelic measurements. But there is a, a reference, and there's a reference point in the Old Testament that helps us make sense of some of these things. The key measurement is that the, the parameters of this new Jerusalem are laid out in, in a cube. It's a perfect cube. You back, go back over there to Revelation chapter 21, and the dimensions uh, show this. Um, notice what it says in verse 15. Uh, in verse 15 of Revelation 21, it says, The one who spoke with me had a gold measuring rod to measure the city and its gates and its wall. The city is laid out as a square, and its length is as great as the width. And he measured the city with the rod, 1,500 miles. Its length and width and height are equal. It's a perfect cube. Well, this is really beautiful. Because, again, John is banking on his Jewish uh, readers who were familiar with the dimensions of Solomon's temple in Jerusalem. And the Holy of Holies just happened to be uh, divided up as a cube. It was a perfect cube. To turn over to... 1 Kings chapter 6. And notice the dimensions that were given for the Holy of Holies where God would come and dwell in the temple. In 1 Kings chapter, chapter 6. In 
In 1 Kings chapter 6, notice what it says in verse 19. Uh, we read, it says, Then he prepared an inner sanctuary within the house in order to place there the ark of the covenant of the Lord. The inner sanctuary was 20 cubits in length, 20 cubits in width, and 20 cubits in height. And he overlaid it with pure gold. In other words, as he tries to give us a sense of just how holy and how prestigious and how honorable, because the Holy of Holies was the precious, forbidden place, really, that that's where the Ark of the Covenant was, where only once a year the high priest could go even and enter in there. We're going to be the invited guests, dwelling in the Holy of Holies. And when he essentially says that he catches, he says, but the beauty of this new temple, there is no temple. In other words, there are no physical uh, parameters. There, 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 are no, there are no boundaries. In fact, go... Read, as we read, go back to Revelation chapter 21. As he gives his dimensions, he says this in verse 22. Revelation chapter 21, verse 22. He says, I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are its temple. Now here's what I just, I have a hard time wrapping my head around this. Let me try to just put it in my own words, maybe as Ezekiel and John, just, here's the likeness or the appearance, the best I can say it. How awe-inspiring it would have been for that priest to go into that holy of holies and be invited to be in the presence of the holy God. What he's saying is that heaven is not going to be contained with a certain place. All the inhabitants of heaven will literally be overwhelmed with the awe-inspiring sense of that holiness and righteousness and beauty of God, it will literally illumine the entire inhabitants of heaven. In other words, heaven is not necessarily a place, but the existence where God's glory and, and beauty literally fills and overwhelms and encapsulates everyone who is invited and privileged to be a part of it. Here's how he describes it. In Revelation chapter 21, in verse 22, he says, I saw no temple in it. In other words, it wasn't restricted to a certain place. This, this idea of the holy as, as, ability where God dwells, notice what he says. He says, for the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are its temple. And the city has no need of the sun or of the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God has illumined it. And its lamp is the Lamb. The nations will walk by its light. And the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. In the daytime, for there will be no night there. Its gates will never be closed. And they will bring the glory and the honor of the nations, notice, into it. Those who have their robes washed are privileged to enter into this, this realm, this domain, this limitless place of God's glorious existence where it's not contained in a temple room but literally the whole place where God is is filled with that glory, that sense of, of, of majesty and all those who are privileged to be near the presence of God will literally be washed over it continually no wonder John even hearing the description of that just fell down that's what this experience is going to be like notice what he says in verse 27 and nothing unclean, and no one who practices abomination and lying shall ever come into it, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. So in other words, as we go to Revelation chapter 21, let's just sum this up here. Here's how he sums it up. What is that experience going to be like? Well, imagine not just God one time doing these actions, but for the rest of your existence, existence, sensing God doing this for you. That's what he's tr trying to get at. And where it's just as the, the high priest only had a one-time experience, and then he left and it was like, oh, well, I can't wait to have that again. It literally will be a never-ending presence of it. Of what? Well, this is what it's going to feel like. Revelation 21 and verse 1. Then... I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there's no longer any sea. And here it is, I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, 
made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people. And what, is it, what is that sensation of his glory going to feel like? This. God wiping our tears away from our eyes. It will be an eternal sense of comfort that never ends. Just the spellbinding honor and glory of God constantly just watching over and filling and dominating through the, that existence. It never ends. It has no boundaries. Everyone will experience this. God himself will be among them, and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. New, eternal, glorious, never-ending. So yes, it truly is worthy of every sacrifice, worthy of the sacrifice of Jesus, and worthy of our sacrifice that it's going to take for us to faithfully follow him all the way through death, to receive that crown of life. We invite anyone who's with us who's never yet still put on the Lord in baptism to hopefully get a small taste, a small dose as John that it's the best it can possibly do, but boy, what a, what a magnificent taste it is. Of just a little glimpse of what our eternal existence will be like, and it will be worth it all. So if you ne have never obeyed God, the gospel, we encourage you to do that while we have an opportunity, confessing that Jesus is the Christ, repenting of your sins, being buried in water for forgiveness of sins, if you've already done so, and you need to come back to the Lord. He is willing to receive you, forgive you if you repent, making your confession and willingness to turn away from those things. We encourage you to do that. Won't you come and obey the gospel? Be right with God while we stand and sing the song together.